theyeshiva.net. The Gemara says, it says in Talmud Yerushalmi, in Tractate Rosh Hashanah, that on the day of a birthday, a person's mazel prevails, a person's mazel goiver, a person's spiritual energy uh, is, has an extra power and energy. Since today is my birthday, so uh, I'll use the opportunity. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I came here at 6.45 a.m. to my Shia today, the first Shia, and there was a huge birthday cake uh, in front of me. That's why I look so good this morning. <laughs> huge, huge. And uh, it said on it, Yom Holadet Sameach, Bishvili Nivra HaOilam. Perfect message for a birthday, right? For me, the world was created. <laughs> So I want to use the opportunity to bless all of you, but that Hashem should fulfill all of your hearts, desires and prayers and requests for all uh, the blessings in your lives and in the lives of your loved ones with tremendous hatzlacha, both materially and spiritually, revealed goodness, and uh, may you all uh, enjoy a tremendous amount of health, happiness, prosperity, and nachas, and all of the blessings that you wish for yourself and your your loved ones. Mary Kaisi Lachem Bracha Ad Bli Dai. Betach Klal Yisrael. So I want to explore today with you one of those uh, seemingly very strange episodes or stories in the Gemara and the Talmud. The story needs a little background in order to appreciate it. The portion of Kairach tells the story of the mutiny staged by Kairach and his many supporters against the leadership of Moses and Aaron, of Moshe and Aaron. In the words of Kairach, he turns to Moshe and he says, Rav Lachem, too much power have you taken for yourself, too much authority have you seized for yourself. The entire community is holy. God dwells among them all. Why do you exalt yourself on the community of Hashem? The story, as we know, ends tragically. The earth opens up and swallows. Kairach, his family members who all joined the revolt, Dasan, Aviram, and their their kin, and they're swallowed up by the earth. To quote the original verse in Parshas Kairach in the book of Numbers, chapter 16, verse 32, Vatifta Ha'aretz Espia, the earth opened its mouth, Vativla Oisam, Ve'ez Batayim, Ve'ez Kala Adam Asher Lekairach, Ve'ez Kala Rechush. It swallowed them, their homes, all the people who belonged to Kairach, and all of their assets, their entire property, and they went down Chayim alive, Sha'ila, into the abyss, Vayoivdum Chakal, they were lost from the, from the community, from the congregation. But then, there is something that happens that is startling. Three portions later, it says Kairach, you go to Chukas, Balak, Pinchas. Numbers chapter 26. Pinchas Perik Chavav Pasikir Aleph. The Torah recalls the events in which Dasa and Aviram, who were all part of the revolt, Kairach, were swallowed up by the earth. And the Torah continues, Uvnei Kairach loy meisu. The children of Kairach did not die. We know from Chronicles, the book of Divrei Hayamim Aleph, Chronicles, we know from the book of Divrei Hayamim that Kairach had three sons. Here in Parshish Kairach, we don't have the names of their sons, but in Divrei Hayamim, in Chronicles 1, chapter 6, we know Kairach had three sons, Asir, Elkanah, Alkana, and Avi Asaf. Asir, Elkanah, Avi Asaf. That's clearly recorded later in the Tanakh, as I said, Divrei Hayamim. So the Torah is telling us here in Pinchas that the children of Kairach did not die. But this is baffling. This is 
what we call shneik suvam hamakchishim zazah. There is a paradox, a contradiction in the text. Here in Kairach, you stated clearly that Kairach and everyone that belonged to Kairach, meaning his family, was swallowed up by the earth. You tell me three portions later, Kairach's children never died. So the Gemara, the Talmud, Tractate Sanhedrin, page 110, Tav Kuf Yud, says, and I quote, Uvnei Kairach loy meisu. The children of Kairach did not die. How? Tanem mishum Rabbeinu. We have learned in the name of our Rebbe, our teacher. Mokoyim nisbatzer lahem begehenem v'yashvu alav v'amru shira. A special place was carved out for them and fortified for them in Gehenna, in purgatory, in the abyss. A special elevated area that was protected. And they sat on it and they said Shira. <laughs> they composed sacred poetry. Rashi himself quotes this. And Rashi has the famous principle that his objective was always to explain the literal meaning of the Torah, Ani loy basi ela lipshutoy shal mikri. Rashi always says, my objective is the literal reading. Rashi himself is perturbed. How can the Pasuk say, in Pinchas uvnei kairach loy meiz, the children of kairach didn't die? So Rashi quotes, and he says, heim hayu be'eit satchila. The children of kairach were really those who devised the revolt. It was their idea. B'sha'as ha'machloikas hiru tshuva belibam. During the bitter fight and conflict, they contemplated repentance in their hearts. And therefore, even though they were swallowed, it's not a contradiction. They didn't die. Why? An elevated area was designated for them in Gehenna, in purgatory. They dwelled there, they sat there, and they sang the praises, as the Gemara says, Amru Shir. Indeed, indeed, where did the Talmud come up with such an idea that a place was carved out in purgatory and that's what the Torah means, they didn't die and they sang songs? The answer is very simple. Open up a book of Tehillim. <laughs> Open up a book of Psalms and you'll see how many chapters, how many poems are composed by who? By the sons of Kairach. Not one, not two, <laughs> not five, not ten. <laughs> More than a dozen. It starts off chapter 42. Membez. Lam Natseach, Maskil, Livnei Kairach. The first 41 chapters of Tehillim. Chapter 41, Mem Aleph, finishes. Kalu Sviloiz, David ben Yishai. I'm sorry, finishes. Baruch Hashem, Alekei Yisrael, Maya Oilam, Vadoilam, Amen, Vaamen. Membez, which is called Sefer Sheni, the second section of Tehillim. Lam Natseach, Maskil, Livnei Kairach. Lam Natseach means to the Menatseach in Hebrew is a, uh, a conductor, a choir master. Who is the choir master conducting the symphony? Because these, these words had symphonies, they had tunes also. And it goes, Mem Dalet, Lam Natseach Liv Nekairach, Mem Hey, Lam Natseach Shanav Liv Nekairach, Mem Vav Liv Nekairach, Mem Zayin, Lam Natseach Liv Nekairach Mizmer. It's a chapter of Tehillim that is said by many communities seven times before the blowing of the shofar. Lam Natseach Liv Nekairach Mizmer, Kala Amim Tikuchav. And then there's Shir Mizmer Liv Nekairach, Kapitel 48, which is said as the song of every single Monday. Shir Mizmer. Shir Shalyayim, at the end of davening, Shir Mizmar Livnei Kairach, Gadol Hashem Ulo Ma'oit. Mem Tes, Lam Natsayach Livnei Kairach, Mizmar. Said the Loyaleinu in Shiva houses. Kapitel Nun, Mizmar La Asaf. Who was Asaf? Asaf was one of the three sons of Kairach. Asir, Asir El Kana. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Asir El Kana Navi Yasef. But you have, you have uh, later, later, this is till Kapitel, till Kapitel Nun. If you go later in Tehillim, you'll go later in Tehillim, and you will have Kapitel Pei Dalet. Lam Natsayach Lagitis Livnei Koirach. Lam Natsayach Livnei Koirach. Livnei Koirach Mizmar Shir Sadasai. Shir Mizmar Livnei Koirach. Lam Natsayach Al Maskil La'anais. Lam Natsayach Al Maskil. Lam Natsayach Al Machalas La'anais Maskil Ahim and Ezrachi. Where do Kairach come to tell him? Where, 
Where do the sons of Kairach come to the book of Tehillim? You ever wondered about that? Where do they come to? When did they write all these poems? When did they sing all these poems? So the Chazal, our sages, put things together. And the Gemara tells us in Tractate Baba Basra, page 15, that David was not the only composer of Tehillim. David collected and edited poems that were written by 10 great Jewish poets. Adam, Malki Tzedek, Avraham, Moshe, Haman, Yudusun, Asaf. And who were the last three? The three children of Kairach. Asir, Elkanah, and Aviyasaf. They are the three poets out of this group of ten, together with some of the greatest, who David used their poetry and compiled it all together in the book of Tehillim. In fact, according to the Malbim, the ultimate editing and concluding of the book of Tehillim was done even generations later, which is why the Gemara in Psachim has opinions that Halal was composed generations later. How does it make it into Tehillim? So the Malbim says, because the ultimate completion of Tehillim was edita- edited in generations later, because there's an opinion that Halal was composed by Mordechai and Esther, by Hananiah, Mishal, and Azariah. There's two different interpretations over there in the Rajbam, if it means that they just repeated it or they composed it. But however you learn it, the Malbim says that Tehillim may have been finished and completed and edited later. In fact, if you open a Tehillim and you go to chapter 42, where it says in Kapitel Membeis, um, Maskil, Lam Natseach Maskil of Kairach. Rashi, in his commentary on Tehillim, says, Who are these Bnei Kairach? He says, It's Asir Elkana Avi Asaf. And here he repeats again in his commentary on Tehillim 42. They were part of their father's plot during the fight. They separated from their father. Perisha, they separated. And Rashi says, when their environment was swallowed up, Bnei Kairach Loi Mesu, they didn't die. V'sham Amru Shira, they had a place where they sang. And that's when they composed these poems, he says. V'sham Yazduam is Marim Alolu. And Rashi continues, V'olu Misha, they ascended. And the divine presence rested on them. And they prophesied not only about the past, they spoke not only about the past, but they also spoke about the future. And that's why you will see in their poems stories about the exile, about the kingdom of David HaMelech and his dynasty, about the Beis HaMikdash and its destruction. These poems of the children of Kairach, you can read them, are some of the most magnificent, inspiring, and heartwarming poems in all of Psalms. When you read them, even at the surface, you're overtaken by a sense of emotion, by a sense of awe. As I said, one of them we recite every single Monday, one we recite on Rosh Hashanah. But my question is, what is the meaning of this story? How are we to understand this? Is it literal? Is it symbolic? What is the symbolism here? What is the theme behind the story? Did it actually happen that way? Are the sages representing an idea through parable? Is purgatory, Gehenna, hell, somewhere underground, and God gave them some box seats in Gehenna to have a front view? Like, what what does this mean? What, What did our sages mean? And they sat there and they composed poetry? Is that what everybody does there? And it's as always these stories that can seem extremely enigmatic, intriguing, and difficult to understand that contain extraordinary, profound messages in understanding our story then and now. To appreciate this, I want to address another question, and we go now from Exhibit A to Exhibit B. Following the swallowing up of the rebels... The Torah relates a whole other story known as the test of the staffs, the test of the sticks. It was conducted when the people were still not satisfied and they protested Aaron's appointment to the Kohuna Gdoyla, to the high priesthood. Hashem tells Moshe, I want you to take a staff from each tribe, a 
of the 12 tribes of Israel. Each staff should be inscribed with the name of the tribe's leader. Take also a stick from Levi, the tribe of Levi, and on that stick you should inscribe the name of Aaron, who is the Kayan Gadol, who comes from the tribe of Levi, Levi, and is the high priest. The staffs are placed for one night, overnight, in the sanctuary, in the Mishkan, in the Holy of Holies. Then, in the morning, they're removed. And what happens? The entire nation beholds that there's one staff that is unique. Aaron's staff has blossomed overnight. It bore fruit, demonstrating that Aaron was indeed God's choice for the high priest. To quote again the Chumash, the Torah says, Kairach chapter 17, Vayhima Macharos. Moshe put all the sticks in the sanctuary. Vayhima Macharos, he comes in the morning. Moshe comes into the oil to the, to the Mishkan. Vayhine Parach Matei Aaron Lebeis Levi. The stick of Aaron that belonged to the tribe of Levi has blossomed. A bud, it, there was a bud, there was a flower, there were almonds. What does Moshe do now? He takes out all the sticks from before God, from the presence of God, to the Jewish people. The Torah says, they look, and each one takes back his stick. What do you think is strange about this story? <laughs> this last piece. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I want back my stick. Hey. I hate to tell this to you. Your stick didn't do any tricks. <laughs> Whether they took back their sticks or didn't take back their sticks, it's really anticlimactic. The point is that nothing happened to their sticks. So Moshe took out the stick. Okay, I understand you worked hard on a stick, you know. <laughs> you carved out a stick. You remember when you went camping and you carved out your stick for six and a half hours so the marshmallows would fit on the point? Lahavdil. They want back their stick. Okay, is, that's the story. That's how the story ends. Vayiru, they saw. Vayikhu ishmateu. Everybody took their stick back. And they made sure to take their own stick. And then God tells Moshe, Aaron's stick shouldn't go back. Aaron's stick should remain in the Holy of Holies where it remained. The stick of Aaron remained there as the Jews went into the land of Israel, as they built the Beis Hamikdash. That staff remained together with the Ark and the Holy of Holies until all of those items were concealed by King Yoshiyahu when he saw that it's not dark yet, but it's getting there as the last days of the first temple were approaching. But I want to ask another story, another question. What is the meaning of this strange miracle? There are so many different types of miracles that Hashem could perform. So you say, well, you needed a miracle. Why this? Why did he choose this idea of every tribe delivering a staff and one staff blossoming to demonstrate the authenticity of the leadership, the priesthood of Aaron. What is even more disturbing is, or even more intriguing is, there were already three major miraculous incidents in this portion that have proved beyond shadow of a doubt that Moshe was not engaged in nepotism. That Aaron didn't become a Kohen Gadol because his brother chose a family member over everybody else. There were already three colossal, dramatic, and earth-shattering, pun intending, pun intended, events. The swallowing of Koirich and the rebels who staged a revolt against Moshe and Aaron was not a miracle enough. After that, there were 250 men who Moshe warned they should not go burn incense in the sanctuary. And they went and they burnt the incense in the sanctuary and they were consumed. 250 men who joined Kairach's revolt. Finally, there was an epidemic that spread against those who came to Moshe and Aaron and said, you murdered God's people. You are a bunch of murderers and an epidemic breaks out, which Aaron then stops by offering the incense, all recorded in Kairach. If you're not impressed with one of these three events, are you going to be an impressed with a couple, are you going to be impressed with a couple of almonds on my stick? 
What exactly did this miracle add to the drama? If somebody doesn't want to believe and they're stubbornly refusing, okay. What was the point and the message of yet a fourth miracle? Just another display of extraordinary wonders? So we really have to go back to the beginning. As always, you always got to go back to the beginning. Why did Kairach stage a revolt? At the surface, it can be read as a simple troublemaker, a rabble rouser. Sometimes people are just what we call bali machlaikas. They love to fight. They love to slander. They love to gossip. They will accuse the most innocent and holy person of horrible things. And it's somehow part of the history of the world. But yet, as our sages say, Kairach pikeach haya. Kairach was wise. The Arizal teaches and says when the Pasuk says, Tzadik katamar yifrach. Ke'erez balavon and yizge. Which we say on Friday night. Mizmer shili on uh, on uh, On Shabbos. I mean... The 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 the, the, shir shayim, the song of Shabbos, tzaddik a tamar yifrach, a tzaddik blossoms like a tamar. A tamar is a date tree. Tzaddik, the last letter of the word tzaddik is kuf. Katamar, the last letter of the word katamar is resh. Yifrach, the last letter of yifrach is ches. That makes up koirach. Tzaddik a tamar yifrach, the seer of Lublin. The holy Chayza of Lublin, one of the great spiritual masters of 18th and early 19th century. He was a Levi, Rabbi Yaakov Yitzchak Halevi Horowitz, the Chayza of Lublin in Poland. So he was a Levi. He would speak about Kairach and he would say, the Halik is Zayde Kairach. He was a Levi. The Horowitzes, many of them are Levi. The Sir of Lublin was a Levi. He would say, my holy grandfather... My holy grandfather Kairach. The Apter of, Rabbi Avram Yeshua Heschel of Apter, one of the great masters also of the 18th, uh, 19th, and 18th, end of 18th century and early 19th century. The Oyev Yisrael of Apter, Rabbi Avram Yeshua Heschel. They once asked him about Kairach. And when he, when he used to say the, Avoid on Yom Kippur. <laughs> we do everything that the high priest used to do on Yom Kippur. So there's a there's a there's a expression in the in the services. Vekach haya oimer. That's what this is what the high priest used to say. And by him in his davening he would say vekach hayisi oimer. And so I used to say. And he said that he was a reincarnation. Where of a soul that was once a high priest, a kind God, who went in Yom Kippur to Kedush Hakadoshim. He also once said that he still remembers himself as one of the sheep in the herd of Yaakov Avinu when he did all those sticks, you know, Akudim, Nikudim, Brudim, all those sticks, those carved out sticks in order to create the dotted and speckled uh, sheep and 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 and, and uh, flock, sheep and goats. He says he he so he still has. He still feels the clap from Yaakov of Hinus. Shtekin. So they once asked him about Kairach. What was your position then? So he said, he said, I want to tell you something. Kairach was so convincing that he got the best of the best. He said, I was neutral. But the fact that I was neutral is only because of Moshe Rabbeinu. He was so convincing Rashi says he got 250 Jewish spiritual leaders, giants, Rashi Sanhedrois, great scholars. How? How? So Kairach was seen not just as a bum. What he did was obviously horribly wrong. But like we spoke about the spies, there's sometimes a deeper, a deeper type of sin. A sin it is, but it's a deeper type of sin. What was Kairach saying? Kairach was saying something that could seem very profound. And that's why he can garner so much support. 
And we could see from what he's saying, we could see what he's saying from the response, because from a response you can always see what it is a response to. What's Moshe's response to Kairach? Moshe says to Kairach, he says, Shimu no bnei Levi, listen up, children of Levi. Is it not enough that God has designated you from the rest of the community to be close to him, to serve in the sanctuary, to serve Hashem? Because these are all members of the tribe of Levi who were part of the service. Uvikashtem gam kohuna? Do you now seek the priesthood as well? So what does Rashi tell us? Rashi says that Moshe told Koirach, you are 250 people who want the high priesthood. I also want it. And I don't have it. That's why he says, is it not enough that you're a Levi? You have to be a Koyan also? You seek the priesthood too? They wanted the priesthood. Rashi says, Afani. Moshe says, I also want it. I also want it. I also want it. What should I tell you? We're not like the pagans. They got many gods and many, many priests and many types of worship and many homes. We have one God, one ark, one Torah, one altar, one Kayin Gadol. You all want the high priesthood. Ich will euch, I also want. And I'm not. What's this conversation here? What's the nature of this conversation? That you all want to be high priests. Well, if you have 250 high priests, so then there's nobody unique and special. Moshe says, I also want it. We have one God, one Aaron, one Torah, one Mizbech, one high priest. Kairach was saying with his people, we all want to serve as Kairachim G'daylam. We all want to be high priests. That's why Moshe tells them, you're Levim, it's great. You don't need the high priesthood. Uvikashtem gam kohuna. What is his answer? Is Moshe dumbing them down? We want to be greater. Moshe says, nah, you don't need it. Just be satisfied with what you have. Let my brother be the greatest. What they're telling Moshe is, we all want to serve God in the sanctuary. As koyanim. And as koyanim g'doylem. We want to bring the offerings. We want to sprinkle the blood. We want to light the menorah. We want to burn the incense. We want to enter into the holies of holies. This is something that Levites could not do. Only priests can do and some things that only high priests can do. Ask Skairach, why is this privilege reserved only for Aaron? And we're all excluded. It's unfair. And that's why the opening words of Kairach's revolt, as I quoted earlier, is the whole Kalal Yisrael is holy. God is in their midst of everybody. Why do you raise yourselves, Al Kahal Hashem? Those are powerful words. As Rashi says, Kairach said, we were all at Sinai. Hashem spoke to all of us. We were all prophets. We all heard his voice. We all saw his truth. Everybody is equally holy. God dwells among every single person. Why have you two decided that you have to be aloof? That you have to be segregated? That you have to designate for yourself a unique vocation? That you have to carve out for yourself a unique position? We all have the right to be holy. We all have the right to be in close proximity to God. We all want to have intimacy with the Rebbeinu Shalom. We don't believe in the idea that we're all equal. But some of us are more equal than others. Animal farm. That's good for the commies. We're all equal. You're not better than us. Why is holiness... Why is intimacy the divine, with the divine reserved for Aaron and reserved for his sons? Not of an Avi who have passed away already at that time, but there was still a Lazar and his summer. And a Lazar had a son later become a Kayan Pinchas. That's what they're telling Moshe. We all want to continue to touch heaven as we once touched heaven when we stood at Sinai. Why? is the gift of oneness with God reserved 
for one individual or at most a few individuals. This is a profound complaint. There's a deep message behind this complaint. Chazal say, He was brilliant. How did they know he was brilliant? <laughs> they did an IQ test on Kairach. Rashi quotes it. How did they know he was brilliant? Maybe he was stupid. <laughs> we know that he was rich. The Gemara says in Psachim, we say in Yiddish, Reich vi Kairach. The Gemara says in Psachim that he found one of the, the, the safes of Yosef, where Yosef put all the money during the hunger. He found one of the Matmoinias, one of Psachim 119. He found one of the safes of Yosef. So we need an expression, he's as Reich vi Kairach. This guy is as wealthy as Kairach. How did they know he was brilliant? Maybe he wasn't so brilliant. Do all brilliant people end up in such messes? One of the explanations is from the story itself they saw his profundity. Not from other stories. From the story itself they understood that there was something very profound about what Kairach was saying. Kairach made a mistake. But the mistake was not a simple mistake. How do I know it's not a simple mistake? I'll prove it to you. Because till today, 3,300 years later, we often make the same mistake. Mistakes that continue for thousands of years are mistakes that endure. You know why they endure? Because there is something behind them. That's why we read the story. That's why we learn the story. What was the mistake? He confused two words. Vocation with status. That was his confusion. He mistakenly believed and confused vocation with status. He looked at the vocation, at the work, at the position, at the daily activities of certain individuals versus others, and he made a wrong assumption. What was it? He mistakenly believed that some Jews are fundamentally closer to God than others. And that's not fair. Some Jews somehow are given the privilege of being closer to the top, closer to the truth, closer to the essence than everybody else. And we just have to stand on and cheer. (laughs) The Jew who dwells in the divine home, the Jew who enters into the Holy of Holies, the Jew who burns incense every morning, the Kayan, creates an aroma, the Aaron who goes into the Holy of Holies, into God's chamber, into God's bedroom. The Tanakh calls Holy of Holies Chadar Hamitos, so to speak, the room of the beds, the Kruvim, that's the place of oneness. He is close to God. But the Jews out there in the boondocks, physically, or conceptually, is obviously lower in status. And the further the boondock, <laughs> the lower in status. So Koirech and his supporters say, who gave you guys a right to hijack God? Who gave you a right to hijack truth? Who gave you a right to hijack holiness? Only you and your brother, or your brother and his kids, they will be the ones who will experience God? They will be the ones who will experience the majesty of oneness, the reality of intimacy with the truth of the cosmos to the exclusion of everybody else who remain outside of the inner circle of those who really, really are privileged to be invited to the mitzvotans. And all we could do is sit by the bleachers and at best clap or fall asleep or get frustrated and run away and create a new stadium. Kairach thundered. This is not the vision of Judaism. This is not what God wanted. I never heard about this. I never heard that there's people who are closer and further. Everybody is holy. Why are you different? We all belong in the Holy of Holies. We all belong in Kairach HaKadoshim. Not just your brother and his children. But Kairach made a profound mistake. 
And it's the mistake that we sometimes make to this very day. Just because your vocation is in the sanctuary doesn't make you essentially closer to God. Kairach put God in the Mishkan on the top. Those who are there are close. Those who are not there are far. It's not fear. The vision of Judaism is the entire earth is filled with his glory as we say every single day in Kedusha and Davening before Kriyashma. We repeat it three times during the morning service. We say every morning, Mala Ha'aretz Kinyanecha. What's Mala Ha'aretz Kinyanecha? Before Kriyashma, literally, the world is filled with Kinyanecha. Kinyanecha means your acquisitions, your possessions. It's basically a way of saying you own everything. Everything in the world belongs to you, like La Shem Ha'aretzim Loya Tevel V'yayishveva. The whole world is filled with your Kinyan. Kainish, you own it. It's yours. You created it. You own it. But the Mezir Chamagat said, Malah Ha'aretz Kinyanecha is, I'll say it in Yiddish and translate, the welt is full mit Zachen, durch welche mekendir koinezayn. The world is filled. Every centimeter, every inch is filled with something through which one can acquire you. Kinyanecha. There's nothing in the world through which one cannot acquire God. The world is filled with things through which I can acquire you. There are Kayanim who God wants to serve in the Holy Temple. There are others He wants not to serve in the Holy Temple. This does not mean you are closer or further from Hashem. It means your job is to find God where you are. The Jewish people are comprised of different types. Each soul was endowed with its particular chemistry, mission, vocation, destiny, purpose, gifts, path, resources, and challenges. I connect through, to God through my journey, and you connect through yours. Each soul is placed exactly where it needs to be in order to achieve what it needs to achieve. It's in that space, geographically and spiritually, where this soul can find Hashem. For me, to go into a place where you belong and say, that's the place. For me, I will not find the truth over there. Some souls belong in Kaidah Shakadoshim in the Holy of Holies, like Aaron and Yom Kippur. And some souls, they were chosen. They were also chosen. They were chosen to discover God in a different place. In a different location. Kairach was correct when he said, Kola Eida Kulam G'dayshim, everybody is holy. He was correct when he said, God dwells in the midst of every single Jew. But that doesn't mean that they have to be doing the same thing. That doesn't mean there's one shape, there's one form, there's one place where everybody connects. Each Jew is equally holy, but in his or her unique way. Some Jews need to enter into the Holy of Holies, while other Jews are given the mission to discover godliness and inspiration within very different terrains of life. And what happens when the kidney looks to the heart and says, you know, I like you. You mamas give blood to everybody. I, I'm just here for the cleaning. <laughs> You're the one pumping. And then the heart looks at the brain and says, I want to be you. <laughs> You're the central nervous system. You're the command. You really do something. What do I do? I pump some fahakta blood. I'm going to become a brain. And the kidney says, I'm going to become a heart. And the heart says, I'm going to become a pancreas and a liver. They don't only destroy themselves. The whole organism dies. The entire system comes crashing down. For Aaron to be in the Holy of Holies, you have to be in what you have to make your Holy of Holies. 
because it's the place where God sent you, even if externally it doesn't look like the Holy of Holies, because that precisely is your mission. It's not only true collectively, it's also true, now let's go individually. Individually. There are moments when I feel like I'm on top of the world. Don't worry, not too often. <laughs> There's moments you feel or I feel or we feel, God is with me. I'm inspired, I'm invigorated, I'm empowered, I'm rejuvenated, I'm energized. There are moments you feel that Hashem is holding your hand and guiding you. It's a moment where you feel so much more powerful and equally so much more humble and the two come together. It's a moment of enlightenment. It's a moment of alignment. It's a moment of oneness. It's a moment where there's an inner cheerfulness and smile that you yourself know very deep. And it's an amazing moment when the world is singing. We say in Tehillim, also Shabbos night, Friday night, Yachad You come to the river and you see it clapping its hands. You come to the mountains and you see the mountains dancing. It ever happened to you? You go to a mountain and it's dancing. It's because you're dancing. And when you're dancing, the mountains dance and the rivers dance. And when you're crying, the mountains cry and the rivers cry. The world is a mirror. But we all know that those feelings, at least for some of us, don't last forever. At other time, what is it called? The pendulum, the seesaw of life swings. It swings the other way. And suddenly I feel like a decomposed banana that has been sitting on my kitchen counter for a week. You know that look? Suddenly, emotionally, I may feel that I'm in the mud. Whether it's because of choices I made, because of mood swings, because of inner anxiety that I deal with, because of turmoil, because of trauma, because of triggers within or without, because of different circumstances or situations I'm confronted within myself or my close environment, or another thousand factors that may contribute to these challenging moments in life. And the great question is, how do I discover God in such a moment? We all make the same mistake that Kairach makes when we think that we find God only in our holy moments. That we're with Hashem in our elevated moments, in our inspired moments. When I'm in a Mishkan, surrounded by a halo of Kedusha, surrounded by an ambiance, engulfed by an ambiance of transcendence, of culpable and palpable, of palpable spirituality. But what about when I feel like I'm in the abyss? What about when I feel that I'm encompassed by, by gravel and filth and debris and mud, mud? I feel detached. I feel alienated. I feel empty or I feel angry. I feel in pain. I'm, I'm confused. There's a void in me. This was Kairach's mistake. It wasn't only a mistake of Klal Yisrael. It was a mistake about every individual who has those moments when God puts you into the Holy of Holies and then other moments when He sends you into a very different place. And yet, God could be found not only in the sacred and lofty spaces, but in every situation, every encounter, every experience. Wherever I am at this moment, I can connect to truth. But here's the catch. It may be a different type of connection, but a connection it is. Kairach believed there's one way of connecting. If I don't have it, I'm disconnected. That's also a form of idolatry. What Moshe Rabbeinu was saying is we have one God. One Aaron, one Torah, one Mizbeach, one Kayin Gadol. Not everybody is supposed to be that person. But it's much deeper than that. What does one God mean? One God means God is undefined. And if God, that's what one means. God is not a statue. God is not a color. And if God is undefined, it means there is no defined way to connect. 
There's no fixed box and fixed rule. This is the mood in which you encounter God. Again, Malay Chalaretz Kvayta. And with this, the Magad of Mizrich incredibly explains one of those powerful stories in Gemara. Open your hearts. The Gemara says in Maseches Shabbos, Tractate Shabbos, page 30, 31. You remember the story? A non-Jew came to Shammai and said, teach me the whole Torah while I'm standing on one foot, on one leg. Al regalachas. What did Shammai do? Docha foy ba'amas binyin. Shammai was holding a contractor's stick, you know, to measure yards and feet and $15 for this and 150 You know, amas uh, habinyin. And the Gemara has to point out how he pushed them away. Could have just said he's told them to leave. No, he had a stick for construction, that construction people work. Dochafoy, out! He came to Hillel. Tom, teach me the whole Torah while I'm on one leg. Hillel said, of course, no problem. How long can you stand on one leg? How long? <laughs> some people 10 seconds, some people a minute, some athletes longer, but not very long. I understand why Shammai got insulted. I'll come to you, I'll walk into Harvard Medical School. Teach me everything about medicine in 39 seconds. You could have tried that in medical school when you went. Thir- you want to be 12 years, good. 39 seconds, go somewhere else. How insulting. Teach me everything about physics in 40 seconds. Really? Teach me all of Judaism while I'm standing on one leg. Come on. That's not nice. Shammai says, go somewhere else. Comes to Hillel. Hillel says, no problem. How long do you have? He said, six seconds. I'll give it to you in six seconds. What you dislike to be done to you, don't do to anybody else. That's the whole Torah. Everything else is commentary on that. Now go study the commentary. Six seconds, he got all of Judaism. Wow, if all rabbis would learn from Hillel. Six second sermons, six second presentations. What's the meaning of this story? Shammai couldn't say it. What did this man come? You want to study Judaism on one leg? Come on. You're coming to Hillel. He dedicated his whole life to study. Is this an intelligent person? Is it an unintelligent person? So the Magad of Mizrich says as follows. Something very deep. He says, this non-Jew appreciated Judaism. If not, he wouldn't want to convert. you got to be crazy. He appreciated Judaism. He comes to Shammai and he says, please teach me the whole Torah while I'm standing al regal echad. I want to stand on one foot a whole time. I want that my inspiration should remain consistent. I want to stand on regal echot. I want to stand on the same madrega, on the same foot, on the same step, on the same foundation. One, always. I'm on fire now. I want to be on fire for the rest of my life. I don't want to be on a roller coaster. I want to always be connected. Hillel picked up Amasa Binyin. Shammai picked up Amasa Binyin. What's Amasa Binyin? Amasa Binyin is the staff of construction. What construction? The construction of the world. Vayi Erev, Vayi Voiker, Yoim Echad. Vayi Erev, Vayi Voiker, Yoim Sheni. There was night, there was morning. One day, day two, day three, day four, day five. There is night and there is morning. The sun sets and the sun rises. It's the fabric of creation. It's the chemistry of life. It's the heartbeat of existence. The heart expands and the heart tracts. We inhale, we exhale. The system attracts, the system expands. There's moments of of narrowness, there's moments of expansiveness, there's moments of darkness, there's moments of light, there's night and there's day. Shammai says, life can't stand, can't be on one foot. The floor, the earth that holds you in life is not stable, it's not consistent. The only thing... 
Somebody once told me, Rabbi Jacobson, the only thing that's predictable about my life is that I'm unpredictable. He wasn't throwing him away. How could Shammai throw a person away? Doesn't Shammai say in Pirkei You remember what Shammai says in Pirkei Yavis? Yavis. The saver, Ponem Yafas, greet everybody nicely. What do you take sticks and throw people away? Shammai wasn't throwing him, he was teaching him about life. He comes to Hillel and he says the same thing to Hillel. Hillel wasn't arguing with Shammai. Hillel had a different method of teaching. Hillel said, let me explain you why God did it this way. Let's go deeper. Shammai told you what? I'll tell you why. What you dislike to be done to you, don't do to anybody else. Hillel told him the following. I want you to think about your life. Why are you converting to Judaism? Tell me. Do you know that in all of the Chazal, when we speak about a child who becomes an adult, what's the expression? Koton shenizgadel. When we speak about a slave who is freed, evet shenishtachrer. When we speak about a non-Jew who converts... The expression is, anybody knows? Geir Shenizgayer. A convert who converts. A convert doesn't convert. A non-Jew converts. Why gay? You don't say, an adult who becomes an adult. An adult doesn't become an adult. Well, some could. Or should. A child becomes an adult. A non-Jew becomes a Jew. Not Geir Shenizgayer. Goy Shenizgayer. The answer says, the Chida is... Why would anybody convert to Judaism? <laughs> the answer is, because you have a Jewish spark before, beforehand. You're a convert before you convert. It's just the divine spark of the Jew lay dormant. That's why the halacha says when somebody wants to convert, you have to explain to them, you could be a good Gentile. Judaism doesn't believe, like Christianity, there's no salvation outside of the church. The Rambam says, Hasidi um sa'olam, the pious among the Gentiles have a part in the world to come. You don't have to be Jewish to be a good person. You could serve God and live a beautiful life as a non-Jew. That's the purpose of a person who's created as a non-Jew. You have your purpose. You don't have to become somebody else. That's what we tell to every potential convert. And if they say, okay, have a wonderful day, great. And if they say no, like Rus, Famous words of Ruth, I will die where you die, I will be buried. Then you accept. In other words, the reason you became a Jew is because there was a Jewish spark in you all the time. So what happened today? The spark was dormant. The spark was latent. The spark was embedded in the sub- Conscious sellers of your soul. What happened today that the spark emerged? The answer is, there was a Jew who fell down very, very low. There was a Jew who didn't remain on the same level of elevation. There was a Jew who spiritually fell into a spiritual abyss. You know what happens when a holy soul goes down very low? As it struggles to go back up, it takes with and it triggers all of the sparks in its environment. It arouses and inspires all those who are in that lowly place. You know why you're here today asking to become a Jew? Because there was a Jew who did not remain stable on one foot, always on one level. There was a Jew who went down so that you could come up. Like in the seesaw. You remember the seesaw? You know why I came up? Because you went down. If you wouldn't have gone down, I could not come up. There was a Jew who went down into the depths of life, into uncomfortable places. And as he or she went down there, what happened? You were infused with a certain consciousness, with a certain spark, with a certain awareness, and your spark turned into a flame. And here you are today. Because the lifeguard 
can't sit on top of the lifeguard's throne. You know, in camp, you remember? That they would sit up there on mile up there, reading a book with their headsets. You can't stay up in your ivory tower to save a soul in the sea. The lifeguard got to jump in. And that's why you have to know what you're doing. Because it's dangerous. You can only go into that place in order to schlep out a soul. I can't remain in an ivory tower and say, Hey, you're drowning. Come to me. Doesn't work that way. He can't come to you. You have to go down. And if you're not ready to go down, those people drown. Khalilah. So Hillel looked at him and said, what you dislike to be done to you, don't do to anybody else. If every Jew would have asked what you're asking for, that they should always remain elevated and inspired, where would have you been today? The only reason you're here today is why? Because somebody went down. So now you cannot ask for a life where you will never be sent into lower places. What was done for you, you have to do for others. That's what Shammai meant with the construction stick. Sometimes God wants me in the Holy of Holies. But sometimes he sends me into other places. You woke up today, you checked your phone, I hope not right when you woke up, you get that text or email, and now your whole day is redefined by the new curveball you have to deal with. Koirach says, it's not fear. Aaron gets to be with God, I don't. Who told you where God is? How do you know where Hashem is? How do you know where the sparks of God are that you have to discover? How do you know? Remember we spoke about the two bulls of Elio Anavi. How do you know which bull is doing Kiddush Hashem? How do you know? Maybe you are experiencing a horrible mood swing and what you feel like is depression or isolation or alienation so that you should be able to bring light into darkness and in that process you will help souls who are engulfed by darkness find their light. As your seesaw goes down, you'll be able to bring them up. But there's only one condition. You could never see yourself as a victim. Only as an ambassador. Only as a messenger. So the Maggit says, Shammai and Hillel were really saying the same thing. Shammai said, this is how creation works. I'm never always on top of the world. In fact... Everything is a ball. Look at planet Earth. Why is it a galgal? It's a galgal. It moves, it moves, it moves. The concept of the rotation of the heavenly spheres and the earthly spheres is not just an astronomical, fascinating uh, truth which helps us understand the seasons and helps us understand Time zones and winter and summer. You ever study these stuff? They're pretty interesting. It's really a reflection of, of all of spiritual life. Galgal, Gilgulim. We roll, we move. We're always moving. It's that Ferris wheel. If you don't want the roller coaster, Marshall, we could do the Ferris wheel. And it's nicer to be in a Ferris wheel, it's slower. The roller coaster is like a super duper looper. You don't know if you're alive or dead. But uh, the Ferris wheel, you know the Ferris wheel? You sit, you go up, and then it stops. And all the Gentiles are taking pictures. And the Jews are like, it's probably broken. What if we stay up here? What if the gate opens up and you start planning your death? And you're taking the last pictures and you're saying, Shema Yisrael, and you do confessions, and you give tzavos to your children. The Gentiles right there are, are eating potato chips and they take out hot dogs and beer and, and you're confessing, you're doing vidu and, and so on and so forth. The Ferris wheel has to be broken. There's no question. And it of course broke when I was on the top, so I can't even jump. I could have been when I was on the bottom. And you're on top. <laughs> and it's a beautiful sight on top of the Ferris wheel. But then you go down. And so the Ferris wheel goes. Who, why is God there and not there? In a circle, as far as I know, there's no higher and there's no lower. The Arizal speaks about Eagle Hagodel. 
The eagle Hagadol of the Ein Soif. There's no Mila, there's no Mata. In the truth, in the truth of Ein Soif, in the truth of infinity, there's no higher and there's no lower. It's perspective. Which part of the ball is the top and which part of the ball is the bottom? Tell me. Turn it around. It's going to be any different? Every letter, there's a top, there's a bottom. You turn around a mem, you turn around a nun, you turn around a tzaddik, it's going to look different. Turn around a samach, turn it over. It's going to look different. Because that's what the ultimate circle, the eagle, the eagle represents true infinity. You can't pinpoint and say, this is the higher part, this is the lower part. So within each, within each individual, wherever I am at this moment, I could connect. And he tells the convert to be Jewish doesn't mean that every day you wake up in the morning and you're equally experiencing the full romantic glory of life. If you could, great. Take the ball and run with it. But sometimes I have to face a demon, I have to face a skeleton, I have to face a challenge, I have to face a mood, I have to face a reality. And I'm looking at it. And the worst thing at that moment is to make Kairach's mistake and say, Aaron is in the Holy of Holies. And I was thrown into the boondocks, divorced from intimacy with God. You're here today. You were brought up because somebody was willing to go down. And now it's your turn to go down so that you can lift others up. And going down doesn't mean you were dejected. It means you were sent to places that perhaps other people can't be sent in order to transform that darkness into light. Yosef HaTzadik is in a mansion in Egypt. He has no mother. He has no father. He has no brothers. They sold him into slavery. All he has is a woman, the wife of Potiphar, who wants him to be immoral and promises she will kill him and torture him if he does not comply. And he's 17 years old, alone in the world. But what happens? He sees an image of Yaakov, his father, in the depth of Egyptian depravity, in a depraved bedroom in, in, in the lowliness of Egypt. Yosef had vision. He saw the image of his father. And he escapes. And he goes out. Yosef didn't say, look where I am. I have been alienated. I have been lost. I have been detached. He didn't say that. He saw God where he was. And you know what you see in halacha? Fascinating thing. The Beis HaMikdash was in Yerushalayim. When you had to eat a carbon in Yerushalayim, where did you have to eat it? In the mechitza, in the walls of Old City. Within the walls. You brought it out of the walls, the meat was disqualified. It was allergic to the unholiness outside of Jerusalem. It's like infected. You can't eat it and we have to burn it. But when the Mishkan was in Shiloh, and you know whose territory Shiloh was? Yosef. You know what the halacha was? There was no wall. So where did you eat the carbon? And the answer is, you can eat it even 50 miles away if you can see. If you can see the sanctuary, even if you're far away, you can eat the offering right there. Morris says, why? Because Yosef. Ben Poiris Aleyoyin. Yosef taught the Jewish people, you could be in the furthest place. But if you have the right vision, you have the right perspective. Right here is holy. What does God tell Moshe at the first time he reveals himself to him by the burning bush? There's a burning bush. It's not being consumed. What does Moshe say? Asura nova eris amara godulazer maduela yures. Now I want to go close and see this tremendous sight. What does Hashem say? Shal na alecha mayaraglecha. Take off your shoes. Why? Ki hamokoim asher ato oimei the love admas koydeshu. The place upon which you stand is sacred. Don't make Kairach's mistake. When I get close to the burning bush, when I can hug the burning bush, hug the tree, then I have reached holiness. No. Take off your shoes. The place where you stand now is sacred soil. God is not there. 
Life doesn't begin tomorrow, next year, when the kids graduate, when the grandkids stop visiting. When Pesach is over, when Shavuos is over, when Sukkot is over, when I do this, when I finish this, when I finish my course, when I retire, when I get a job, when I buy the new house, when I move here. Hamakim ashata oimid alav. The st- place, physically and emotionally, where I am right now, you have to be able to find Admas Kodesh. Find the opportunity, find the truth, find the energy, because there's no one model of connecting to truth. Truth is one and undefined, and therefore can express itself in endless colors. If God was a statue, there would be many, but also very limited way. God is undefined, and therefore there's no defined way of doing it, of, of, of connecting to him. Oh, now come back to me and you'll see that this whole shear, the sages said it in one line. Uvnei Kairach loy meisu, the children of Kairach didn't die. Why didn't they die? So the Gemara says, Makayim nizbatsu lehem begehenim, v'amru alav shira. There was a place for them in Gehenim. And what did they do there? They sang the song of God. This is the story. The children of Kairach initiated the revolt. They're the ones who said it's unfair. Equality. God doesn't belong to certain individuals. We don't have an elitist group. That's not what our nation works like. There's an inner circle. You are the guys who are close and we're the losers. Who just look at you and clap our hands and say how lucky we are to look at you from the bleachers. That's not Judaism. That's, uh, you know, that's called Hollywood. Or power. Judaism is truth. Truth is in everyone. Truth is everywhere. You're not closer to God than, or further than God than anybody else. What's this Moshe and Aaron? You're in the Holy of Holies. Not fear. Not bad. Good stuff. Now I understand why they mobilize the greatest people. Great people understand this. Mediocre people don't understand this. <laughs> they surrender their souls to mediocrity. Great people don't want to live lives of quiet desperation. They want to suck the marrow out of life. But in the middle of the argument, the middle of the debate, when they looked at Moshe, they looked into his eyes, they understood this is not about nepotism. This is about... Where God wants you to be, they realize their fateful error. And what was their discovery? Their discovery in one sentence is, our mistake was that we divided life into two sections. We divided people into two sections. There are those who are in paradise, and there are those who are in hell. There are those who are in Ganadin, and there are those who are in Gehenna. And the ones who are in Gehenna need to look at those in Gan Eden who will pray for them and smile to them so they can feel that they also have hope. And this they protested. But then they realized that this was our own erroneous perspective based on the short-sightedness of the human ego. Paradise and hell are perspectives. And then they realized that in Gehenna, you can sing to God. Which means what you called Gehenna is really just an opportunity to be able to write your own unique poetry. And to be able to create your own tapestry of music. Wherever you are in the world, on the top of a mountain, or in the depth of the abyss, God is available to you. You can sing God, God's praises and connect to Him right there, right then, right now. You don't have to be in a particular mode to be connected. Hashem is available in every reality because He is every reality. Wherever you are, whatever emotions you have, whatever mood you're in these are the places where God wants to meet you so imagine imagine my best friend 
says, Rabbi, why, why, please come today, 12 o'clock to this and this place. I want to meet you. And then I think to myself, you know, I would really like to go to a beautiful hotel. So I go to this most exquisite hotel and I'm sitting in the lobby, you know, for how long? For a week. You know why? Because that was not the place he told me he's going to meet me. It's a beautiful place, but it's not where he told me he's going to meet me. When you're experiencing a certain challenge, that's the place where God invited you for a meeting. That's the place of the meeting. You don't have to run. You don't have to deny. You don't have to suppress. You don't have to crush. You don't have to obliterate. You don't have to feel guilty. You don't have to feel like a colossal failure and a mess and a piece of garbage and shmata and get angry and jealous. No. V'noi adati l'choshom. Aaron has his place. You have your place. God says, this is where I want to meet you. Panim el panim. What do they say in Hebrew? Begovai nayim, yeah? Begovai nayim. How do they say in Tzvas? I want to speak to you. Begovai nayim. Face to face. I want to meet you here. Vuloivste. I have to go to the Waldorf. I have to go to the Ritz. No, no, no. God is in the alley. He's in the alley, but the alley is dirty. So what? There may be treasures in the alley. Motsosi, David Avdi, Heichen Motsosiv, Bizdoim. David was found in Zdoim, Chazal say. Gimel Boyim Behesa Chadas, the Gemara says, and had Mashiach, Metziah, Akrov. Three things come when you don't think about them Mashiach, a Metziah, and a scorpion. The sages couldn't have a better comparison for Mashiach than a scorpion. But that's exactly the point. Redemption doesn't come from a place where you always expect it. From the places of glory, from the people of glory. It sometimes comes from the situations which you least expect it. But when you're experiencing a certain day, when you have to go to a certain place, physically or emotionally, it's just a meeting place with Hashem. I'm there. I'm here with you. Let's work this through together. And you don't know how many souls will be coming up because you went down. But you went down with dignity. You went down as a shliach, as an ambassador, not as a victim. What does the connection with God look like when I'm in a bad mood? (laughs) What does it look like? What does it look like when I'm not inspired? What does it look like when I feel trauma or pain? What does the connection look like? And the answer is, there is no specific look. That's the point. It doesn't have to look like anything. God doesn't have to look like blue or orange or green or yellow or red or black or white. These are beautiful colors. And I'm sure these colors match some of your personalities. But sometimes I encounter different colors and sometimes I'm colorblind. I once read a book called The Color of Water. The Color of Water. It's a book about, it's an autobiography of an African-American, very successful man, a journalist for the New York Times, a black African-American, very talented person, whose mother grew up in New York in a Jewish home. Her uncle violated her physically in a horrendous way. She not only left Judaism, but she married a black man who became a priest a Baptist minister, I believe, died young. And she was left to raise, I think, 11 children, black children, living in the projects on her own. But she was a Yiddish Medele. And there was groups and gangsters. It was a horrible community. He describes it all. And her mother got them all through school, college, education, turned them into mention, successful people, all African-Americans who don't know they're Jewish, but they're all Jewish kids. And he says, once he was walking with his mother, it was the days of a lot of racism, and uh, he asked his mother, why do people, people don't like blacks? And his mother says, unfortunately, they look at the value of a person based on color. So he says, I asked my mother, but what color does God have? Is God black or white? So my mother said, God is colorless. 
So I told my mother, how can something be colorless? So she said, what color does water have? God is the color of water. It's the source of all colors. And if you put water in a blue cup, the water will look blue. And if you put water in a, in a red cup, the water is going to look red. But the water is not blue or red. But the water will take on a different look. So he titled his autobiography, The Color of Water. It left a very deep impression on me. But that's exactly the point. There's no color of water. There's no color of Avedis Hashem. What does serving God look like? Of course we have the fixed mitzvahs. I daven and I learn and I have to do the 630 mitzvahs. But so much of life doesn't have a color. The connection doesn't have a color. A relationship with God doesn't have a shape, a look, a style, an attitude, a, a, a way of saying this is the way we connect. It doesn't have a flavor. It captures the truth of that moment. What is the truth of this moment, of this person, of this experience? Sometimes it's found in a yearning, in a thirst. How do I know? Look at the first poem of the children of Kairach. Lam Natseach, Kapitel Membeis. Lam Natseach. This is the poem from hell. And I say, if this is hell, then you tell me what's paradise. Listen, like an aisle, an aisle is a, uh, a ram, a heart, ah? I hear she, a ram, ka aisle tarig, like a, uh, tarig is like a ram which pines, it yearns, it cries for rivulets of water, afike moyim, are brooks of water. Ke nafshi sarig elecha elikim. The imagery, you ever saw a hungry, Hungry deer, a hungry elephant herd, hungry, uh, thirsty, thirsty elephants, thirsty deer, thirsty rams, thirsty hearts, finding the water in the African drought. You ever saw the scene? And they go over to the water and they're all quenching their thirst. That's the imagery of the children of Kairach. Ke nafshi sarag elecha elekim. That's how my soul points for truth. Tsama nafshi lelekim lekel chay. My soul thirsts. My tears became my bread day and night when they said to me, where is your God? This is the poetry that was created in Gehenna. This is the poetry of Tehillim. Sometimes that's the connection. Sometimes the connection is found in resolve, in courage, in determination. Sometimes it's found in vulnerability. Sometimes it's found in pain. Sometimes it's found in the humility of the question. Reb Nachman of Breslov once said, what do we say? Kaddish, 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 Malach, Kaddish, Kvoide, Malach, the Gedengst. Meshar, Savshay, Alem, Zela, Zeh, Aye, Mekayim, Kvoide. Where is the place of his glory? Reb Nachman said, Aye, Mekayim, Kvoide. Sometimes his place is in the question, Aye, where? Sometimes that's where his place is, in that question. Because it's the questions that unite us. It's the answers that divide us. Sometimes it's found in the openness created by the void. In the humility that's created by the question. Sometimes... It's created by the readiness to take accountability, to assume responsibility, to say I'm sorry, to express remorse and make amends. How do you know what connection looks like? Sometimes connection looks like one thing, and that is I have to now say I'm sorry. Sometimes it's my ability to reject voices of despair and cho choose the voice of hope. Choose the voice of promise, of joy over the voice of despair and catastrophe. 
Ka'ayol Tareg Alafike Mayim. So it's Kairach's children who taught the Jewish world about perspective. What is the furthest place from the Holy of Holies? What's the furthest place? And the answer is Gehenna. That's where they composed their poetry. This is the idea they did tshuva. They were redefining the paradigm of Judaism. There's no such a thing you're far. There's no such a thing you're not close. There's no such a thing you're an outcast. You're not part of the elitist circle that doesn't exist. Kairach was right and Kairach was wrong. He was right. He was wrong when he confused status with vocation. I am never too far to create poetry out of my life. Never. There is never a reality that can't become a shira. David HaMelech knew this best when he said, a shira l'ashem b'chayai. You remember the London School of Jewish Music? A shira l'ashem b'chayai. So it comes from David HaMelech before the London School of Jewish Music. It comes from the Ein Gedi School of Jewish Music, King David's school. Maybe it was Hebron or some desert that he was in. Ashira Lashem Bechayai. All of life is a song. All of my life is a song. Every moment can become a potential note in the divine symphony that we call life. And that's why you will see a fascinating thing. In the Shir Shal Yoim of Monday, the song that we say every Monday is Shir Mizmar Livnei Kairach. And you know what we say? I'm going to quote a few words and you'll see, again, the whole Shir in their song. Shir Mizmar was said yesterday, Monday. Shir Mizmar Livnei Kairach. Listen how they start. Gadol Adinoyu Muhulal Ma'oid Be'ir Eleheinu Har Kachay. The Lord is great, and He's very much praised. You know where? In the city of our God, in the mountain of His sanctuary. They continue. God is in its palaces, known for its exalt, for their exalted and grandiose nature. But then they continue and say. Diminu eloikim chazdecha bekerev hechalecha. Diminu comes from the word dimyoin. We thought, we had an imagination that your kindness is in the midst of your temple. Bekerev hechalecha. That's why we revolted. And then they continue. Keshimcha eloikim. Kein tehiloscha al katzve eretz. We thought we had a dimyon. We'll find you in the chamber. But as is your name, so is your praise upon the ends of the earth. Who can understand this better if not the Bnei Kairach? Where are they saying this? We know where they are saying this. They are the ones who are teaching the truth of the relationship, the truth of the divinity. In the beginning of the Mizmar, they're still going through this reflection, this introspection. Where is truth? Where is hope? Where is spirituality? Where is Ruchnius? Where is Dveikus? Where is Yiddishkeit? There. And where am I today? <laughs> I'm in Gehenna. At least I feel that way. And that's the answer. You feel that way because God wants to meet you there. Right here. Right now. Keshim Chelikim Kenti Loschal Katzveyeretz. Ah, now you'll see what happens with the sticks. You thought I forgot, yeah? You thought I forgot. You're projecting, you forgot. <laughs> no, not you, I know you didn't forget. The complainers saw the miracles. They understood that there was a miracle. They thought God punished Kairach and his followers to avenge the honor of Moshe. After all, Moshe is God's servant. Even Miriam was penalized for, uh, for talking about Moshe. So they were also penalized. But they still might not grasp Kairach's fundamental mistake. Sometimes you could look at an argument and say, okay, they won. 
but you don't understand your fundamental perspective hasn't changed. Sometimes life changes our position, but not our perspective. Sometimes I have no choice. I have to say, okay, he was right. I was wrong. But I wished I was right (laughs) because my paradigms have not changed. People can sometimes be shaken up, but if they're stubborn, they may give in, but they're not ready to rethink everything because it's hard. You can't judge them. Miracle after miracle after miracle. Earth can open up and swallow everything. Incense can consume. Epidemics can spread. But internally, I'm not ready to get off my high horse, especially when I couch, when I uh, decorate it with religious vocabulary. God needed to fundamentally transform their paradigm. How do you do that? He said, I need everybody's stick. Everybody. And everybody gave a stick. And he said, you know what? We're going to do what Kairach wanted. This is what people don't realize about this story. In this story, Hashem said, we're going to go with Kairach's philosophy. Everybody wants to go into the Holy of Holies? I'm going to do it. I'm going to take their sticks and bring it into the Holy of Holies. People don't realize God was reenacting what Kairach wanted. Everybody should be a kind God. Great. Everybody's stick representing their tribe, their pride, their royalty, their dignity, their cain is going into the Holy of Holies. We're all there. Kairach said, that's where we all want to be. That's where we're going to reach our potential. But what happens? In the morning, they all take a look at their stick. Their sticks remained as plain as can be. One stick blossomed. What about their sticks? What God was saying is, your staff will blossom. But for your staff to blossom, it has to be elsewhere. Aaron's stick is going to blossom here. Your stick will also blossom. That's why the Torah doesn't say, Moshe took out the sticks. Everybody looked at and said, hey, Aaron won. Vayiru, they saw. And what's the next line? That's the key of the whole story. Vayikhu ishmatehu. Everybody took back their stick. That's the punchline. Everybody claimed their stick. Why did they need it? This is the punchline. Take your stick and go where you have to go with your stick. Stick represents the journey, right? We call it the walking stick. The mate. Mate Elikim Moshe walks with the stick. Aaron walks with the stick. Take your stick. And go where you have to go. Let Aaron's stick remain in the Holy of Holies. Because that's where his staff blossoms. But everyone's flowers blossom in different places. Everybody's flower can blossom. But you have to know where, when, and how. Your your stick is destined to produce a beautiful orchard. But don't think that there's one way to be holy by making the mistake of Kairach and his followers. Far from that sanctuary, from that hub, their staffs can blossom. And therefore, therefore, that becomes the story that's not just a miracle. It becomes the story to alter perspective. You thought that if we let everybody come in to this place, everybody will become great. It's not how it works. Everybody came in. That wasn't, that wasn't the problem. You don't have to go somewhere else. Let Aaron inspire you from Aaron's place. So that you should be able to inspire yourself from your place. That's why Bnei Kairach, the children of Kairach, which by the way doesn't only mean the biological children of Kairach. It means what is the legacy of Kairach? Children are legacies. Bnei Kairach loy mesu. 
the legacy of Kairach does not die. Not only in the negative, also in the positive. There was something about Kairach's message that remains alive and well. And that is, Kol ha'eda kulam kedoshim. Everybody is holy and God is among everybody. That message remains chai v'kayim, loy meis. That legacy of Kairach remains. But how does it remain? It remains through the children of Kairach who taught that wherever you are in the world and wherever you are in life geographically and emotionally, there is a song waiting for you to compose and sing. A song that has never been sung before you and will never be sung after you. Have a wonderful week. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.